Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. In this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome Bill McKibben. He is the founder of uh, Step It Up, dot, uh, Step it Up, which became 350.org. He's also the founder of thirdact.org. Uh, he is also a prolific author. Uh, Bill, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Good to be with you. And I, I start, start us off with a weather report from Texas because the rest of the country has been reading about what's going on down there. It's warm here. It uh, gets hot in Texas. But yeah, the fortunately, the grid, the ERCOT grid is standing up to it. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, had a little technical difficulty, therefore no mic and no earphones today. But uh, uh, yes, it's hot and uh, it's going to be hot for a while because it's only June. But um, let me jump in here, Bill. I warned you guests on this podcast introduce themselves. So if you don't mind, imagine you've arrived somewhere and you don't know anyone and you have about a minute to introduce yourself. Please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm a writer. That's what I've mostly done with my life. That's how I've earned my keep. Um, and I, I wrote the first book about what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect back in 1989 when I was in my 20s um, and working at The New Yorker. And I've um, written a bunch of books since, but also I volunteer as a, a activist uh, working on climate issues. And you're the author of 20 books, you said we were talking before offline. So uh, and the latest is called The Flag, The Cross and the Station Wagon. A graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. Um, so uh, we had a little technical difficulty, so we restarted. But I'll ask you this question again. I've been writing a long time. Um, I have an audience in mind when I write. For whom do you write? Is there a person or a certain group of people that you think about when you're writing? There's not a particular person, I don't think. But my goal is always, as a writer, and this is a good question, to to try and um, answer the questions that are arising in a reader's mind close to the moment when they arise. Um, I really uh, prize clarity in writing above all. And I think that's really what clarity means, that uh, if you can figure out what question is going to be coming up in someone's head and then try to be answering it. And so you wrote a memoir um, that's as I've been reading it um, and and I'll you open the book, uh, The Flag, the Cross and the Station Wagon. You wrote about a demonstration against the Vietnam War in your hometown, Lexington, Massachusetts, that was in 1971. And that obviously was a formative experience for you. Um, I thought it was interesting and it made me think of uh, a guy, a friend of mine, Robert Apodaca, who's a housing activist in California, and he and I have talked about these issues. And in fact, we he's in a documentary that we're making now on the grid and electricity. And he said that for today's generation, the younger generation today, today, climate change is their Vietnam. Does that ring true to you? Huh. I don't think I, I think for me, it feels less like that then um, maybe a continuation of the work that started at the same time with the first Earth Day and and also is, uh, is somehow connected to the civil rights movement. My great colleague and dear friend, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, uh, always says, oh, these are the lunch counter moments of our time um, on the planet while we're taking on, you know, pipelines and things like that. And I, I think that may I, that have even more resonance for me than than some of the Vietnam stuff. So climate change is the modern civil rights movement. I don't think it's exactly equivalent, but I think that there are things that are the that that, that overlap, especially the sense of injustice. It's always struck me that climate change is not only the biggest practical problem we've ever faced as a species, but it might be the most unfair thing we've ever done. Um, the iron law of global warming, it seems to me, is that the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you get hit by it. And I mean, we see that all the time. 
Um, I was thinking of it particularly last year when those, you remember those incredible floods hit Pakistan, uh, you know, the biggest flood since Noah. Uh, it just started raining and didn't stop. And um, eventually there were 33 million people affected, something like that. Um, but Pakistan's put well less than 1% of all the carbon into the atmosphere. So that, that kind of level of just completely uh, unf uh, unfairness, that seems to me to connect it to a lot of other things in, in our history, some of, some of the sad parts of our history. Uh-huh. Well, let me go back to your the beginning part of your book. You said uh, you begin it in the in the very first section. You say, "What the hell happened?" Mm. How do we go from an America where that kind of modest paradise you were talking about the house that you grew up in mm. seemed destined to spread to more and more of the country to the doubtful nation we inhabit fifty years later, a society strained by bleak racial and economic inequality where life expectancy was falling even before a pandemic that deepened our divisions on a heating planet whose physical future is dangerously in question. Mm. Um, and you put a question mark at that. So how do you answer that question? What happened? Well, I mean, that's really what the book is about. And it's not really, a, I mean, it's as close to a memoir as I'll ever write, but it's not very much of one. It's more, more of an argument, really. And the argument was that the 1970s, my period of adolescence, and I think years too, was uh, really turns out to have been a critical decade in a lot of ways. If I had to explain it, I'd say we entered that decade still embarked on the notion of America as a group project, uh, where we, you know, as we had in the New Deal and the Second World War, we were still engaged in trying to make the country a better place, um, sometimes very contentiously, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, whatever, but all of that seeming to add up to people's hopes that they could figure out how to make this place better. But it ran into, in the course of that decade, a highly, highly individualized view of the world, um, uh, where just the idea of a kind of group project <laughs> became a kind of anathema. And I think by decade's end, we'd sort of made the decision. Uh, the, first, the first true watershed might have been Proposition 13 in California and uh, uh, that antipathy towards paying the taxes for things like public education that mark a group project. And then 1980, and the election of uh, Ronald Reagan, who was convinced that markets would solve all problems, uh, that our job was to get rich as individuals. It was his pal, Maggie Thatcher, who memorably said, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women. And I think we've pretty much been under the spell of that for the 40 years since. And I, I think, it's turned out not to be true. Um, markets didn't solve all our problems. If they had, then the poles would not be melting and we wouldn't live in a uh, society of almost cartoonish inequality where, you know, individual Americans have as much wealth as the bottom third of the population. Um, um, so I, I, so are you I, saying there was a collective, more of a collective spirit that after the post-war years that ended in the seventies, uh, is that where that's my, heard? that's my thought. Yes. That we became a more hyper individualized. I mean, America has always been a place of uh, places, a high premium on individualism and should, but somehow it got, uh, out of balance, dramatically out of balance. And, um, and I think that's really, um, explains an awful lot about the, to me, quite um, quite often quite painful world that we're inhabiting at the moment. Um, well, and so, I hope well, maybe so tie, we're starting so tie, to so break out about, of it a little bit. Yeah, so tie that to, 
climate then? What what was the thing then that? It, well, are you arguing sure. that if we had a more collective government today, then we wouldn't use as many hydrocarbons? I'm, I'm, no, I think no. I, I I don't know about that, but I think we clearly would have made a more um, determined response. Remember, so two things. Remember first, scientists gave us a good fair warning about what was going on. Um, by 19, really by 1988, 89, when I was writing that book and when Jimmy Ensign was testifying before Congress and whatever, we basically knew everything we know now about climate change. Um, you know, it was, it was there from the get go. Um, and we haven't responded, uh, not, not very powerfully, not in our government and, and in many other places around the world that were following our lead. So, and I think that the that our denigration of government was one of the reasons for that. You know, Barack Obama in one of his exit interviews was asked why he would really gotten so little done, even when he had 60 Democratic senators to work with. And he said, we were still in the kind of hangover from the uh, Reagan years. The idea that government was bad was still dominating our our worldview, you know, in the in the immediate sort of case of Reagan and uh, Carter, uh, one of the things I learned doing that book that was interesting to me was the depth of Carter's planning for solar power and its deployment. I mean, I'd known that he'd put solar panels on the White House roof and things, but I did not know that his budget, proposed budget for the year uh, it would have gone into effect or he would have tried to put into effect had he won that election in 1980, uh, would have put America on a path to try and get 20% of its power from solar energy by the year 2000. Right. Um, had we gotten anywhere close to that, then the climate story would have turned out differently, I think, than it did. We wouldn't have solved it by now, but we'd uh, we, we would have done the work in the 1980s that we ended up doing in the 2010s to dramatically reduce the costs of renewable energy and things, and we'd probably be a lot closer. Who knows what else would have happened, you know, with Carter there too. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that because I want to talk more broadly about international issues and climate. And But so I've been looking at the new statistical review of world energy. Um, but I want to put this to you because we are about the same age. We're both born in 1960 raised in different parts of the country. You were raised in Massachusetts. I was raised in Oklahoma. Uh, we both have our critics um, and we've debated before. Um, and I think it's fair to say we have some different views on energy and power, which I'll get into. But I also wanted to see, well, where do we agree? Um, I, 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 uh, I'll put my card on the table. I, I believe in the United States. I'm a big believer in the future of the U.S. I'm bullish on the U.S. for a lot of reasons. Um, dem demographics, uh, our geography, our con the Constitution. Um, I interviewed an economist, Peter St. Ange, who's going to be on the, I recorded the podcast. He called the Constitution our our superpower. So I'm absolutely bullish on the United States. I'm, I'm a lover of nature. I'm an avid bird watcher. Um, so I wanted to just see where what are the things on which you and I agree because I'm gonna I wanted to get into some parts where I think we're gonna disagree and mm. probably, probably strenuously. Well, I you know I, I grew up in Lexington as you know, and my job for many years my high school job was giving tours of the Battle Green in Lexington to tourists who would drop by. I had my tricorn hat. And I would tell over and over and over the story of the, in some ways, of the first day of America. Um, and uh, I am, and I remain patriotic. I'm grateful for that early exposure because I think one of the things it let me understand was that there was no dissonance between patriotism and dissent. Um, those, you know, Minutemen were early dissenters. Um, and I'm also really cognizant more all the time of the weaknesses and sadnesses and flaws in our country. You know, I, when I was doing that book, one of the things one of the real revelations was I went back and was rereading Paul Revere's diaries. Um, 
uh, his account of his famous ride, which was the one that Longfellow was working from when he wrote the famous poem. And at one point in that, uh, uh, in that account, Revere says that he was talking about encountering a couple of British officers and having to evade them. And he said it happened in Charlestown Common, right under the place where Mark hangs. It's like, what is that about? And it took some research to figure it out. No one, I, had, I don't think anyone wretched had written about it before. Turns out that there was a slave in Massachusetts named Mark, uh, and he had a particularly cruel master who he his sister poisoned. And they, uh, uh, I think they burned alive his sister after the trial, but him they um, drawn and quartered and then they hung in what they called a gibbet, an iron cage. And they kept it up there for, that was 20 years before the revolution and it was still up there 20 years after the revolution. And it was such a landmark that Revere could count on everybody in New England knowing what he meant when he made a passing reference to it. And um, it was a good reminder that, uh, you know, um, liberty meant something a little bit different to the um, people who were fighting on that green than hopefully it means to us today. So I do have great hopes for this country. I think we're engaged in a remarkable task. Anand Gerondias said in a book a couple of years ago, said, America's trying very hard to do something that hasn't happened ever before, which is to become the first truly multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy on the planet where there's no majority anything. And demographics will get us, you know, there. But the question is whether what kind of um, what kind of country will be as we get there. I think some of the strains of that are showing. I think that some of the, you know, the ugliness around uh, Donald Trump and things are signs of that strain. But I have hope that if we work hard, we can figure out how to do it. And it's one of the reasons why at Third Act, we work hard both on climate and on democracy and racial justice. Well, let me follow on that, because I think, uh, you know, I'll, I, uh, there are parts of that that I agree with. And I, uh, I think what I see in the U.S. is that concerns me greatly is the class divide, right, that we have developed an underclass in the United States. Uh, that has a little hope and little prospect, a few prospects. Um, but I want to follow on that because it's kind of a natural transition. Rui Teixeira, who's also been on the podcast, who, as you know, is a Democratic strategist. Mm -hmm. uh, on his Substack, he wrote a piece recently called The Working Class Isn't Down with the Green Transition. I'm mm -hmm. going to quote from what he said. In a new Monmouth poll, just 1% of the working class, non-college voters, in an open-ended question, identify climate change as the biggest concern facing their family. He also cites the University of Chicago Energy Policy Institute poll done with AP Nork said, quote, in terms of costs, Americans would be willing, uh, in terms of costs, Americans would be willing to absorb to fight, fight climate change. Survey finds that just 38% of Americans would be willing to pay even $1 extra on their monthly household energy expenses to combat climate change. It's the lowest figure since AP Nork started asking this question in 2016. It's down 14 points since 2021 and an amazing 19 points since its high point in 2018, end quote. Uh, do you believe the poll? Or, and if so, why are so few people willing to pay more for action on climate change? Well, I think you're right that there's extraordinary class divides in this country and that we've done a poor job of, um, well, of, first of all, uh, leveling them out some um, just by uh, uh, doing what other countries, other industrialized countries have done, which is, you know, offer a decent floor for people um, um, so that they're not in such want and need. Um, and I imagine that at the moment, if, the, if one was trying to figure out why right now it's high, it's because inflation has been rough on everyone. Um, and so I think that that's, I think that's doubtless, uh, uh, correct. Um, of course, the thing is that if we let climate change get any more out of control, the cost of that to everybody, but especially to the poorest and most vulnerable people 
is going to be numbers that are so large we hardly have the calculators to to put them up i mean the the last figure i saw for and i would not put too much stock in its specificity but uh for total damages on this planet from uh unchecked climate change uh, we're 551 trillion by the end of the century, which I believe is more money than currently exists on the planet. So if what we're worried about is the cost of living, and we should be for all kinds of people, and what we're worried about is our ability to make economic progress, then I think we better figure out a way to get climate stuff under control and fast. So let me let me cite to share again from that same piece on his Substack. He said, I just don't see how you get the working class to support a clean energy transition unless it becomes more of a crusade for abundant, cheap, reliable energy and less about the cultural commitment of college educated Democrats to an economy built around wind, solar and electric vehicles, no matter the cost. The working class is not on board with the latter. Uh, as I said, I spent a lot of time in rural America. I spent a lot of time with people who, you know, turn riches. Those are the people that I love and, and hope to write for, speak for. But this, again, goes back to the class issue. Is this, a, is this a disconnect within the Democratic left about who they, they are often represent themselves as the working, you know, representative of the working class? But I've, I've said this before, is why uh, and uh, why are, and I've asked this question. Well, so why isn't then why is to share his point? Why isn't why aren't more working class people, as he says, down with the uh, with the energy transition? Well, I've spent my almost my whole life in rural America. Um, it's, it's where I live and um, and some of it in kind of blue state uh, rural America in vermont and much of it here where i am now in red state rural america uh, in upstate new york elise stefanik's district and truthfully i find all kinds of people across political persuasions uh really interested in renewable energy uh solar panels in particular and uh i think that the reasons vary from depending on kind of political orientation. I have a lot of conservative friends who are really into solar power because once you get your panels up on your roof, maybe then you don't have to depend on anyone else. Your home really is your castle. And I have a lot of more liberal friends, especially in Vermont, who like the idea of everybody united by the, you know, groovy power of the sun. And um, that's all cool. I and mean, those differences one can work across. Um, my guess is that over the long run, and I think that the numbers are starting to bear this out, it's going to be more economical for people to be doing this, especially if we begin to get some incentive to help at the start. And some of that's finally starting to flow through the federal government. So we're seeing dramatic increases, uptake in uh, people who want solar power. Um, um, and I think that's a helpful and hopeful thing. I have eight and a half kilowatts of solar on the roof of my house. Why did I do it? Because I got three different subsidies, right? So you know, I, but I'm one of the fortunate people that can have solar, but let's come back to solar. So a lot of your work is focused on the United States, but I spend a lot of time looking at the statistical review. I mentioned that, that it just came out in the last few days. CO2 emissions continue to rise. They went up 321 gigatons last year. Biggest numerical increases were in India and Indonesia, up by 131 and 172 gigatons, respectively. Indonesia's coal use last year jumped by 1.5 exajoules. As I look at this, I'll just you know put it out there, and then I'll ask you the question. It seems to me the U.S. matters less and less. We've cut about a thousand gigatons on an absolute basis out from our emissions with the last uh, well, 2004. But developing countries, particularly in Southern Asia, are their, their emissions are skyrocketing. So I, um, the question I wrote down. So what's your position on climate action in countries like India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where they're building coal plants? And their emissions are soaring. Oh, uh, do you think that should not be allowed? Do you think it should? Oh, I think the whole That's world matters a lot here. 
that's why when we set up um, 350.org, we worked in every country in the world. Uh, we've not quite. We've organized actions in every country on planet Earth except North Korea, which take a braver soul than me to figure out how to organize. But we have wonderful partners and colleagues in all those places. In fact, if I can take a minute to say it, um, I hope people will. Uh, one of our colleagues, a completely wonderful woman, uh, Huang Hong, uh, in Vietnam, um, was put in jail by their government a few weeks ago, uh, doing tr trying to do just what you're talking about, uh, uh, taking on their uh, coal power. And if people could um, write uh, their congressman um, um, or the State Department or both, uh, it would be good to try and put what pressure we can to get Hong out of jail. She's a tremendous, tremendous soul. She weighs, I think, about 90 pounds, and she's about four foot ten or something. But she's as tough and and great a person as I know. And I, I do not like the thought of her languishing in that jail. At any rate, those places, yes, people have to take them on. And the good news is that um, when we do that work as best we can in those places starts to help. You know, when we started 350.org, we organized um, 200 demonstrations at our first big day of action in China. Uh, and, you know, it's so, so I, take, with, I take what you're saying, but why are these countries building along with a well, I mean, along with a lot of other, you know, people pushing, some of them are starting to make real progress. I was just looking at the new numbers today from China. Uh, which show them on course to meet their renewable energy targets five years ahead of schedule. Uh, their solar capacity has uh, reached uh, more than the rest of the world combined, and they're making huge strides in wind. And I think that some of that's starting to spread to other parts of South Asia. You know that they've just passed these um, um, uh, or put in, begun to put in effect these I, I forget the acronym. It's like Jet P agreements or something, just transition protocol agreements with several of these countries um, uh, to get some global funding for doing uh, a lot of this work. And hopefully it'll begin to tell because you're right. It's really important to get everybody on board. It is worth remembering but, but, as but Americans. Let me, but, but let, is, me, but let me interrupt. But so why are these countries building coal plants? I mean, the, the, this is the part that. As I see it, well, they have. I mean, I, my, Vietnam, Vietnam just announced. I wrote about it on my Substack. They just announced they're increasing their coal mining in Vietnam by fifteen percent. Their 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 use of energy in general is obviously going way way up. They're at the same point in the energy curve that China was a while ago, and the hope is that they'll use a lot less coal than they otherwise would have as they go through that. For my money, India is going to be the key question here. And India really is the first huge country that has a chance of making a serious big scale energy transition without being mostly reliant on fossil fuel. And that's because uh, the price has dropped so sharply that it really makes sense. You can now build a new solar farm in India because it has terrific sun resource for less money then you can simply to operate an existing coal-fired power plant. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen easily or immediately. Look, uh, Prime Minister Modi ran for office traveling on the um, corporate jet of the biggest coal company in India, uh, Adani, one of the biggest coal companies in the world. They've got a big, powerful energy lobby like we do, too. So it, you know, there, it, but, but, it you may know, not happen, but it, but the the hope is that it will, and I think that there are some good signs. Let me just add, just something I think Americans should always worth remembering, um, uh, when we talk about energy policy here close to home, no one's ever going to catch up to America in the amount of carbon that we've put in the atmosphere. We're always going to hold the championship for the most. Um, and in per capita terms, we remain light years ahead of Indonesians and sure. Indians and everybody else. And it is worth, at least I try to remind myself sometimes, just how long we've been at it. I mean, all the carbon flowed out of the back 
of the tailpipe of my family's maroon Plymouth Fury in 1975 when I was getting my learner's permit is still up in the atmosphere there trapping heat. So I, I try to bear that in mind when I can. But fair enough. But isn't this, uh, I'll put it to you, as I just wrote about Vietnam and I wrote about the U.S. commitment to build solar panels in Angola, 60% of the people in Angola don't have access to electricity. There are 3.7 billion people around the world who use less electricity or about the same as an American refrigerator. There is a massive amount of electricity poverty. And yeah, yeah. This so, is a really good point. But are I you, get to, but are, you arguing, see, are you arguing that they shouldn't build coal plants? Because as I see it, Vietnam's building coal plants. Bangladesh. Oh, I'm arguing, yes. No, I'm definitely yeah. arguing they shouldn't build. I'm definitely arguing they shouldn't build coal plants, but I'm not really doing the arguing. It's my colleagues uh, on the ground in, uh, in Africa and Asia that are doing that arguing. But I have gotten to go there and spend some time. Have you gotten? If you you've probably gotten to do some reporting in Africa over the years. Only a little bit in India, not in Africa. A Africa, I've I've spent a lot of time in both, and you know it's really is interesting because your point about energy poverty is very true. Um, you know, there I, at least when I was doing this writing a few years ago, there were still more people on Earth without electricity than there were the day that Edison invented the light bulb, right? which tells you something about demographics. Um, so, well, so, so why so should, those, we, so why should those, we finance most of those, gas most fire? Of those, most of those are in Africa, some in Asia. And the UN now, I mean, the, the reason they don't have electricity is not because people weren't building coal plants, it's because no one's ever gonna run the grid out to rural Africa. Um, the UN now estimates that 90% of those people will get their first power from renewable energy. And indeed, it's really moving um, to watch it start to happen, partly because it just reminds you of all that we take for granted. I was in Ghana uh, in a village out in the, out in the country, um, and a wonderful young American, not so young, American, African-American uh, uh, entrepreneur had gone there and across much of that part of the world, she had set up these uh, village scale solar platforms. Um, you know, this village had maybe 70 solar panels to start and they'd hooked them up the day before, rudimentary wiring, hut to hut. Um, and so we were sitting around talking about it. And I was talking with the elders and they, you know, we were sitting out in the sun and it was too hot for me. I'm not from Texas. I'm from the north in the mountains. So I was too hot. And they kept handing me cold waters, cold bottles of water to drink. And it took me about 15 minutes, grateful though I was, to realize why they were so proud of it. Uh, it was just for the reason you'd been saying. Until the day before, when those solar panels had gone in, there hadn't been a refrigerator in that town. The, the concept of cold was really kind of sort of new. Yeah, and, um, and fair enough. So, so I'll grant you that. And it's a good story. Yeah. I, I, I'll grant you that. But why would the U.S. not finance a gas-fired power plant in Angola? The Africa is rapidly urbanizing. I'll take your point that rural areas are going to use solar. It makes more sense than stringing high-voltage high transmission lines. Well, but I imagine, Africa, but Africa, I imagine, Africa I imagine is rapidly, you, rapidly urbanizing. So why is is uh, Vijaya Ramachandran from Breakthrough Institute calls this is green colonialism? Why aren't we allowing I, I, I Royce, that, it's the same thing? Why aren't we building a gas fired power plant for Angola, which will produce far more power for Angolans than would those solar panels? Why, so what are, 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 you, are, you, are you opposed to that? What are, what are colleagues in across Africa, 350 Africa and places would tell you is twofold, at least. One is these are the parts of the world that face by far the largest consequences already from climate change. So the last thing they want is more uh, anything that drives the temperature any higher. Second but reason- But aren't they gonna need more second, energy to protect themselves from climate the second, change? Well, the second reason, so let's, let's, let me finish out here, then go after me. Second reason is, um, as you know, now we've got finally got good data on 
the other problems that go with fossil fuel combustion. Uh, as of last year, the big meta study showing that about 9 million people a year, one death in five on this planet, came from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel, those particulates that get in your lungs. That's not mostly you nor me. That's mostly people in urban areas in the global south. So they're very eager to get off of that uh, to the extent they can. And the third reason is economics. Um, they're in many countries, uh, uh, they're very eager to be using least cost technologies that get them out of the cycle of dependence. 80% of people in this country live in countries that are net importers of fossil fuel, which means that their balance of payments and trade deficit and stuff is, I mean, once you hook yourself, you know, onto the um, fossil fuel machine, that becomes a huge driver of everything else in, in, in your scheme. And they're aware of the fact that the um, same sun hovers over North America and Southern Africa and are eager to take some advantage of that. In, you know, in the same way I was just reading in the Washington Post this morning, uh, the discussion of the fact that solar panels are really bailing out uh, uh, Texas today in, as the uh, uh, P wave goes on. Well, they're eager for some of that too. They don't really want, you know, uh, uh, you, know you know, 19th or early 20th century technology. They'd like to uh, have some 21st century technology. Okay, so fair enough. But Angola doesn't fit that story. Angola is a member of OPEC. Angola has massive natural gas resources. Why wouldn't the Americans... You, you know more about Angola than I do, so I see you oh, to the ground. I don't know. But I, 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 I don't know. But you would but be I opposed, know, could be opposed I, I, to I, gas the countries I know, the be countries I know best. The countries I know best in Africa are Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Nigeria, and South Africa. These are the ones where I've traveled yeah. most and studied most. They're a lot bigger than Angola, and Angola may be unique in having uh, easy access to some uh, fossil fuel of its own. When there are countries where people have fossil fuel, as you know, there's often a great and sad uh, uh, effort to use it and use it in ways that end up not redounding very much to the benefit of and those. The and those are and those are all and those are all. I will accept all those points, but uh, I'm I'm going to press you on this. So you're opposed yeah. to uh, building gas fired generation in Angola. You don't want. I, I'm, I'm, I, as I say, you know more about Angola than me, so I, I'm I'm happy to leave it to you. I don't know. I don't know. So you, I, I, I'm it's happy clear to, that the I'm same happy to go study in Angola, investment. but I've never, yes. I've never, I've never been there. But if okay, it, but, it's, but it's always you, possible you, that there's, are it's you, always are possible you, that there's some place on Earth where it makes some kind of sense to still be building fossil fuel stuff. But truthfully, I, I doubt it. Um, my so guess, if, well, if, 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 if that's the case, then are, are all so many of these countries? Well, let's talk about China. Sure. Global Energy Monitor just reported earlier this year that last year, China permitted two new coal plants a week. Those aren't my numbers, Global Energy Monitor. It's roughly 100 gigawatts of new coal-fired capacity. So uh, uh, why would countries like, I can list them for you, Ang uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia in particular, Vietnam, China, if solar and wind are cheaper, why are they building coal plants? Well, because there's an extraordinary amount of momentum and vested interest in this system that keeps it moving forward in a lot of the ways where it's been going. I mean, it's not just because they want, a lot of, they want reliable well, power, that they want reliable electricity and they want it 24-7. They do want, I mean, I'm sure they want reliable electricity. But as we as we know, I mean, for instance, as the uh, Washington Post pointed out this morning, it's precisely that solar that's providing the reliable power that's keeping Texas online today, you sure. know? So happily, we live in a world where you can have both uh, clean and affordable power and reliable power, and you don't longer need to depend on fossil fuel. The, the, the story has shifted over the last decade in profound ways as the price of renewable energy has come down, 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 down. We're still used to thinking of, and there may be people all over the world still used to thinking of 
renewable energy as alternative energy, as the kind of whole foods of energy, you know. But at this point, it's really the Sam's Club of energy. I mean, we live on a planet where the cheapest way to produce an electron is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. So given the extraordinary economic problems that come from climate change, we should be doing everything we can to take advantage of that. Fair if you enough. do, you so, also so, get some so other... If I take, so if I take, other, if I take you your do. point and that renewables are cheaper, why... If you do, are, why are, you how, do, why, why is just, California uh, seeing just, such rapid increases in electricity prices? I, I don't know. Let me just finish the point I was trying to make. If you do, okay, you get some other powerful side benefits too. Um, we talked before about the health part of this, the fact that one death in five in this world comes from relying on, on comes from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. The other thing that we've been reminded of, I think, in the last year or two, is that as long as we're dramatically dependent on energy sources that are only come from a few places, and that's the point of fossil fuel, there's relatively few deposits around the world, then the people who control those deposits end up with way more power than they should have. Um, point in case at the moment, Vladimir Putin. Uh, biggest oil baron of the north of Europe, of Asia, and has taken his winnings and used it to launch a land war in Europe in the 21st century, which is why, one of the reasons anyway, that Europe is now scrambling over time to get off uh, 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 oil and gas as fast as they can. And building, I just saw today, the number is saying that uh, uh, investment in solar energy across Europe has tripled no more, gone up 398% in the last 12 months, year on year. So you made the point about the number of deaths, 9 million is the number I recall mm -hmm. you saying. How many yeah. lives have been saved by hydrocarbons? Well, I mean, as I said before, the, the world we live in is defined by hydrocarbons. So, you know, I guess it answers itself. I mean, uh, but that's not the. It doesn't. Uh, seem but to I think it, you're only you're only focusing point. on the negative side, and I'll I, I take your point. Yes, sure. it does have negative side sure. effects, and uh, you've talked about solar panels, much of which are being sourced from China, some of which are being built with slave labor in in Xinjiang province. Yes, and there's so, no question that we've but, got to figure out how to do lithium and not just uh, you know solar panels and lithium we got to figure out how to do cobalt and things as right. well as we possibly so, uh, so will you but, will you accept the but, point that many millions perhaps even billions of people when you count the haber bosch process uh, synthetic nitrogen that these in fact hydrocarbons are sustaining life for not just a few million people but in fact half of the food we produce in the world today is due to haber bosch and the fact that we use natural gas to create synthetic fertilizer, isn't that a positive thing? All, all I've heard you say is, I, I've seeded your points on renewables, I take your <laughs> point. But is, are, are, is there no sure. value in hydrocarbons? I, that's what the I've world, heard. There's, there's endless, I mean, there's been lots of value in hydrocarbons. I mean, think of it even more deeply than hydrocarbons. I mean, for 700,000 years, human beings have made their way in the world by setting stuff on fire. And it's been great in ways even deeper than the Haber-Bosch process. I mean, that's what let us, uh, you know, cook food and gave us the big brain. That's what let us move north and south away from the equator. That's what uh, uh, the anthropologists think that are, you know, uh, many of these social bonds that mark our species come from those eons of standing around the campfire, the kind of proto-Zoom, you know. Uh, and then in the Industrial Revolution comes, and, and we learn to control the combustion of coal and gas and oil, and that defines modernity. It's everything around us. The problem is, and the potential is, that now it's producing a huge number of drawbacks as well. And the good news is we no longer need to rely on them. Now, I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, you, have, you can stop me here if you want, because I may be going astray. I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, you know. Um, so I am, um, I am convicted of the fact that uh, the good Lord was kind enough to hang a large ball of burning gas 
93 million miles away, and now we have the wit to make full use of it, and we should. I like the idea of energy from heaven instead of energy from hell. And I think we can make this transition. I think we're at a, you asked before about like excitement and, and, and the future of America, indeed the future of the world. I think we're in this amazing moment when it won't be that long before we can stop an awful lot of the large scale combustion on this planet, when our habit of setting things on fire will become smaller. Now we're gonna be using the Haber-Bosch process for a while. I think that's like 1% or 1.5% one of emissions on the planet. So probably not decisive in terms of its effect on the climate. So I wouldn't be the place where I would start Fair cutting. Enough. Fair enough. So uh, you mentioned combustion. And so far, you haven't mentioned wind. You've mentioned solar. We can come back to wind. Well, I, I think of them. I got to say, I think of them as the the as very tightly linked because the sun. We can catch its rays on that photovoltaic panel, but then we take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth, creating those. Uh, Fair enough. You, you know me as a Sunday school teacher. I'm drawn to that very first paragraph in Genesis where. The first thing that happens is the uh, uh, the spirit of the the breeze blows across the earth. You know, um, right? Well, we'll, we'll talk. I, I want to come back to redemption and belief because that's part of what I, I teed up here, um, and I have more questions probably for the hour that we've set aside. But nevertheless, <laughs> so you're opposed to combustion. Then why aren't I wouldn't you, say, why I wouldn't aren't say you opposed to? I, well, that's what I've heard you say. You've said no, written, no I said I said I think we're in a place where we'll be able to get past. Right. large scale combustion before long. I'm and you also said we should stop burning things. I remember you writing that recently. So then why, yeah. you, why aren't you coming out full throated? Bill Tucker wrote about this. He interviewed you a long time ago, the late Bill Tucker, about nuclear power. And he, as I recall the article, he said he met you at an, an event and it was a rally, I think, for uh, renewables or something. And he asked you, why aren't you in favor of nuclear? And he quoted you as saying, as I recall, that if I endorse nuclear, it would cut this movement in half. So you have I, any, that's any not true. That's okay. not true. I've right. never said that. Fair enough. Fair enough. And the I have leading, said all along. Leading climate scientists. And Robert, I've said, okay, let me just tell you, I've, I've been saying now for many years that I think we should keep the nuclear plants open that we have open as long as we can do so safely. I've said that on the cover of Time magazine, and I've said it in left-wing magazines like The Nation, and I've said it in intellectual journals like the New York Review of Books, and on and on and on. I don't think it's likely to be the way we work ourselves out of this problem for a couple of reasons. One, it's slow, and time is not something we have a lot of. Two, it's expensive. I think the best data on this I've seen comes from this huge Oxford study that came out last year that I wrote a lot about in The New Yorker. And they were the first that I've seen that tried to compare very directly how much it would cost to uh, uh, put up renewables versus our current system. And it turns out that if you go rapidly to renewables, you save, and, and this was a Texan, by the way, who was doing the uh, key part of this work, uh, who said that you'd save something like $30 trillion over the next few decades by going quickly to renewables, just because you'd have to pay so much less for coal and gas and oil. That's the reason I imagine that this is not a happy prospect for the Exxons of the world. But then they directly compared it to what if you put nuclear in the mix too, and they said that makes it much, much more expensive. It may be that we'll get, my friend Jim Hansen, um, who I think is the greatest climate scientist that ever lived, has assured me that we will reach a point where we have cheap, small nuclear reactors that eat the waste and and will be, you know, far better than the uh, enormous uh, ones we have at the moment that seem to produce mostly cost overruns. Uh, and if we get there, then um, then the whole landscape may change. But I think in the time that we have right now, that physics has given us to deal with climate change. It's pretty clear that the least cost option straight ahead is sun and wind and happily the batteries to store them because the sun goes down and the wind drops. Happily, so does the price of batteries and it's plummeting. It's not just plummeting, the innovation in it is so amazing. And that was the real point of this Oxford study about renewables. It's that there are technologies 
that get on learning curves and technologies that don't. Fossil fuels don't. Fossil fuels have, you know, the price. Well, I, I, would, I would argue that the, the shale revolution disproves that. I mean, that that I think is a red herring. Let's the go price back. Of, let's the go price back. of oil is pretty much what it was, you know, uh, 10 years ago. Let's but go the, back. Let's go back. The price of renewables <laughs> just keeps plummeting. And that right. is a but, remarkable but there, thing. But there are many friction points on, nuke, on renewables, and we'll get to that. I'll, I'll grant your points on nuclear. Hansen has said, and I think I'm quoting him directly here, he said, believing that we can solve the problem with renewables is akin to believing in the tooth fairy or the Easter bunny. You just yeah. identified him as the, as the world's leading climate scientist. He I is, do think he's the world's leading if, climate if, scientist. If this is an existential And I think he said that, I think he said that a number of years ago, yeah, he did. the price dropped by roughly 90%. Well, I, haven't, I haven't heard him say that renewables are the way to go. If he has- I haven't either. I haven't talked to them about fair, it recently. But fair enough. I take, but my it, point it, is I take seriously what he says and I'm not at all, I mean, I'm glad that there's some money for in the IRA, for instance, for research on new forms of nuclear. We'll see what right. happens. And there's, an, and there's a tax credit under the production tax credit. We'll see what happens. Well, but my right. guess but, is but if, we're going to see- but here's the, here's the part, Bill, that where we part company. And I, you know, okay. I want to see where we agree and where we disagree. And this is one that I think we stridently disagree. You, you repeatedly say climate change is the most important threat that we face, that this is the existential threat. Then why, given your platform, given your influence, I've identified you as the most famous environmental or climate activist in America. If this is such an important issue to you, why wouldn't you be beating the drum like hell for nuclear? Because we have all these European countries that are constrained on land use. You have the Chinese are building uh, nuclear faster than any other country in the world. If this is, if climate is such the issue and your issue, why wouldn't you be promoting nuclear power? You have a powerful plan. Because I just explained, I think that it's, that it spends way more money than it takes to do renewable energy. And I but, think money but lasts, but those always in short last, supply. But those plants I mean, will last a century and the solar panels and wind turbines will have to be replaced after a people, couple of decades. Believe it or not, the economists who go to work on these things actually factor in that when they're figuring out the costs. And, uh, you know, and then they actually give nuclear a break because they don't factor in the fact that we don't know what to do with the waste and on and on. But I'm willing to concede that. My guess is that given 10,000 years, Humans will figure out something to do with nuclear waste. I worry less about the risk of that than I do about the, I mean, if you operate- if You're saying the waste is your biggest concern? No, I just said the opposite. I, you, weren't, you weren't listening. I said, I'm willing to grant that we'll probably figure out some way to deal with it at some point. A nuclear plant, something has to go wrong for it to wreck the planet. A gas plant just has to operate according to spec for it to destroy the earth. The, the real reason at the moment, though, is that the economics mean we can make this transition happen at scale and on pace with renewable energy. And I don't think that that's probably true around nuclear power. OK, and I'll grant you there are, there, there are a lot I'm, of friction I'm, points around nuclear and I've and I've talked about them. And I saw I went to Fukushima Daiichi. I was there. I saw the damage that can be done. But so let's talk about renewables. Hmm. Simple question. You've lived in Vermont many years. I understand you're in New York now. Why aren't there any wind turbines being built in Vermont? Well, because there's a de facto moratorium on them because people don't want to look at them. So then if that's the case, then why are you hitching your wagon to a, process, a renewable? Uh, because I'm hopeful platform? that we can, I'm hopeful we can, I'm hopeful we can persuade people that there's something beautiful about them. And in many parts of the country, people have been willing to make that case. I think that they're, I, I think they're gorgeous. Uh, uh, I've worked hard have, to get you them have built. Any in your neighborhood there in New yes, York? Yes, I've worked hard to get them built here in uh, upstate New York, a few miles from where I live. I'll send you the piece I wrote for the New York Times in, I think, 2004, so early on, arguing that they should be built here. And I've obviously worked hard to get them built in Vermont um, and advocated for building them. Uh, at the mountain at the end of my top of my valley um, um, on Middlebury Gap. Is, so, is there no irony, Bill, in this that for years, I mean, this is where, I, again, we part company. Environmentalism, and you and I are the exact same age. I remember I was in fourth grade in Mrs. Jackway's class and it was Earth Day and we went and walked around the block and it's Earth Day. Okay, great. 
And the environmental ethic for all of our lifetime effectively has been small is beautiful. Let's have small footprints. So we, you know, energy sprawl is it's sprawl of any kind, urban sprawl, any kind of sprawl is the wrong way to go. And yet you're promoting, this is the part where as a bird watcher in particular, the wind energy business, and I've talked to, as you know, and you've, you've written about me in the New Yorker and criticized the fact that I keep track of the number of rejections, but there are people all across the country who are saying, we don't want these projects in our neighborhood. We don't want the visual blight. We don't want this noise pollution. So, yeah, are, should, are these, so, I, so what I, so what I, my response is when people tell me that is, well, I understand that, you know, um, and in the best of all possible worlds, we'd have some magic thing to make our energy that doesn't cause any trouble at all. But we're not in the best of all possible worlds. And I have traveled the world in which we do live. So I know who pays the price for America's energy habits now. I've been in Bangladesh. I've been in Africa. I've been in India. I've seen what it means in those places. So I'm willing to pay some price myself and I think we all should be. I think we have some debt to work off. My um my backyard is dominated by big stock with some solar panels on it. Is it beautiful? No, not really. Um does it in a certain to to uh use the extend the metaphor in a certain light does it look beautiful to me? Yes, the the light of understanding that it means we're taking responsibility closer to home for the things that we use. And that extends to, I don't know whether you can hear the birds around me as we're talking today. Uh, I'm a bird lover too. And I know that by far the gravest danger that avian life and all other forms of life on this planet face is the very, very rapid heating of this earth. It's orders of magnitude more dangerous to birds and everything else than building more wind turbines. And I, I, if I, we I, don't I, get it under control, we're gonna have, I mean, the scientists are absolutely clear that we're on the edge of the sixth great mass extinction on this planet. So yeah, I, you know, I like looking at renewable energy. I think that it's a um, reflection of what's best about us. In, so in you're content with covering state-sized mm -hmm. provinces of the United States. You were in the Mother Jones recently uh, with an article about this very thing, saying we should build more. And Jesse Jenkins had a piece in that same issue in which he laid out that we would have to cover, I think it was for wind turbines in a land area of Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, something like that. I do that. not think that's correct. For, for I think provinces that's incorrect. Or provinces. I think that those numbers are incorrect. The numbers I've seen indicate that it takes up less space than the current space we devote to oil and gas drilling. Yeah, I, I, but at I, any rate, it's just not true, Bill. At any rate, look at the, uh, that is simply not responsible. Well, look at the work that David Keith and Lee, Lee Miller did at Harvard. They estimated, and Václav Smil's numbers are almost the same that to generate enough, the existing electricity demand, not electrify everything with wind turbines would cover a land area the size of two Californias, 900,000 square kilometers. This I have a strong feeling that we're talking uh, apples and oranges here because the data I've seen on wind turbines I, I, I doesn't indicate that at all. Um, it indicates that you have to build wind turbines, but that you're able to continue to do agriculture around those wind turbines. I, I, I've heard this claim as well, but that's and, not the case. The reason the, the, and what's happening in New York, where you live, is local communities saying, we don't want 600 foot high wind turbines in our neighborhoods because they ruin our view sheds. They're bad for property values. There are numerous studies that have shown this. So I guess I just might. Yeah, I guess I, I guess we're, you know, I think we're at the point where, uh, 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 as I said, and this goes back to the discussion we were having at the very beginning, there was a moment when Americans decided that property values were more important than other things. And I think that that was a mistake. I think that's what led to this world of hyper-individualism in which we live. And I know that we have to stop because we've been going an hour, but, uh, but, I hope that this is one of the ways that we get out of this, that we begin to realize that we can cooperate 
to do things in our communities and localities to provide the energy that we need, more of the food that we need, uh, more of everything that we need. Well, so, I take so, the point so, about, so just the last couple of quick um, questions then, because I know you yeah. want to stop and I don't under, I understand why, because, you know, I'm just getting warmed up. But well, the, you, I, mean, we've, I think we said an hour, so we've been going. That, that's uh, that's fair enough. That, do, so. you, do you support the uh, condemnation of private property then for solar and wind projects? I mean, because in New York, the, 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 the New York, they have a rule that will allow the state to bigfoot local communities in terms of wind and solar. I don't know. At the moment, I'm what I'm hopeful is that we can find enough property owners who are uh, happy to have their property used for that, and that they're allowed to do it. Okay. So my so, and, and and more personally, so you attacked me in the pages of the New Yorker. They corrected, issued corrections. You didn't bother to call me. Uh, are you opposed to me keeping track of the number of rejections you seem to object to this? Oh, I'm happy to keep track of it. I'm happy everybody. And I didn't attack you. And in fact, didn't we attack did call you and you had a long, you, you, you were able to uh, 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 explain precisely what you were doing. And it was printed in the New Yorker right from the start. And I didn't, you know, I've looked over your, I've just for, uh, uh, fun the other day, I was looking over your blog. You've gone after me time and again. You called me two-faced and on and on uh, long before any of this. And you never called me to uh, ask my what I thought about I, anything I emailed else. you, I emailed you two just, times, Bill, and you didn't just, reply. That's just rude. So and, I didn't bring and, that up. And, and I didn't, didn't bring that up, brother. But you you, you know, I know that, that, that people love in our current world to take umbrage at things. And I didn't take umbrage at that. I was happy to come on and talk with you anyway. And I've enjoyed talking with you. But I have no idea why this sort of, uh, you know, used to be in this country that people just kind of um, were able to, you know, accept that there'd be disagreement and not be taking so much uh, umbrage at everything. That's what we do up here in the Northeast. Maybe people a little more sensitive in Texas. I don't know. But uh, it's good fun to talk with you. Well, fair enough. So uh, you're ready to sign off. That's fine. Um, uh, I ask these questions of all my guests. What are you reading? Oof, that is a good question. Um, on the, in these topics, the last really fascinating book, you know, everybody read, and rightly so, Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry for the Future. I'm sure you read it. It's fascinating. But I like even better his novel, One Before That, uh, New York 2140. If you like New York City, and I do like New York City, uh, it's a great novel about New York. It's a kind of post-flood New York. The water's risen, but people are figuring out how to keep on keeping on in a lot of ways. And, you know, we didn't really talk about that, but that's some of what we're going to have to be doing on this planet. because we wasted a lot of time we're way behind the eight ball now even if we do everything right from this point uh we're going to be dealing with dramatic and difficult uh physical challenges even the next couple of years this new el nino that's kicking in now on top of the temperature that we've raised with carbon in the atmosphere is going to be truly traumatic and it's the reason i hope above all that we're able to come together in certain ways, because we're going to need that solidarity in a way we haven't before. I sometimes think, and this goes back a little bit to that Kim Stanley Robinson book, I sometimes think that Americans for the last 75 years have been the first people on earth who could get away with not knowing their neighbors, not relying on them. I mean, if you've got a credit card, some guy will deliver everything you need to your door. You never have to see another human being. But I doubt the next 75 years are going to be like that. I think we're probably going to be in enough trouble that we're going to need to relearn the lessons that humans have known for many, many thousands of years about neighborliness uh, on all scales, your neighbor next door, your neighbor in your community, but also your neighbor in China and Vietnam and Angola and all the other good places you brought up. So for me, New York 2140 was a good, one good way in there. Well, I, so I said one more question, but I, you, in your book, I want to refer back to that yeah. because, uh, you know, we clearly disagree and I'm pleased that you came on the podcast. It took a while to make it happen. 
you end the book by talking about redemption. And I didn't know you were a uh, Sunday school teacher, but you end it by saying the only way I'm quoting here, quote, the only way to make our heritage any better is to make our present and future better. Perhaps if we install enough solar panels, again, solar panels, then the American science and engineering of the 20th century, which birthed those miraculous devices will be remembered for more than making the comfortable more so. You go on, this kind of redemption rests not on suppressing the truth of our past, but on engaging and overcoming it. Redemption means actively supporting the changes need to make that transition. Redemption has religious connotations, and but you're talking about it here in a community kind of way. Um, what do you mean by using that word redemption in that space there? How do you how do you define redemption? Well, I, in what I was talking about, I mean, A, I am a religious guy. I'm a Christian and I make no apologies for it. Um, and B, in that case, what I was talking about more was American history. Much of that book's kind of about American history, uh, partly because I grew up in Lexington. And I think there's much to redeem. I mean, we are a country that classified uh, large parts of our population as three fifths a human being for a century and kept them in slavery. And then for the century after that, kept them in Jim Crow, you know, um, and still to this day uh, uh, have allowed to exist extraordinary gulfs in uh, wealth and income. You can still measure Here's an example. You know about the racist redlining that the federal government engaged in in the early part of the 20th century and how we took different communities, neighborhoods, and said this was rated A and go invest here, and this place where it's all Black people is rated D and don't invest here. You know, I was just doing a story about um, a study that some kidney doctors were doing, of all people, because they were noticing uh, that you could track um, kidney stone disease across these redlining, across these redlined districts. And the reason turns out to be that because of that disinvestment in those poor neighborhoods, black neighborhoods that didn't get trees, parks, all those other things. If you look at a city like Portland, Oregon, the average temperature difference between the, on a hot day, between the A rated neighborhoods and the D rated neighborhoods was 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So think about that in Texas today when you're in the middle of a heat wave, you know, how much nice it would be to be in a place that was 12 degrees cooler than the place you're in at the moment. When I say America has some work to do and needs some redemption, that's what I'm talking about. Now on Sunday morning, we can talk about a different kind of redemption and you're you're welcome at our Methodist church uh, whenever you want to come and and that works for me too but um um but that's what I mean we've got some stuff to make up for here and around the world and I think we're completely capable of doing it um but I think we have to get to work so you may have answered this question with that but I'll uh, this is the question I always end on so and I've done now some 200 podcasts what gives you hope We've talked about a lot of things that um, uh, where we disagree, and I'm yeah. glad we could talk. And I think it was fairly, fairly civil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was entirely not only civil, um, but there, um, there. So I'm hopeful. You, you, you warn about the future. You look at the future, and a lot of what I see, you write it. it it's very uh, dire. So yeah, I'm not always. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I mean, look, the cheerful title of the first book about all this that I wrote back in 1989 was The End of Nature. So I'm not a Pollyanna by any means, but I, well, here's what I think. I think that climate change is a test of whether or not the big brain was a good adaptation or not. Um, it clearly got us in some trouble, and we'll see if it can get us out of trouble. And my intuition is that it'll rest at least as much on the size of the heart that the brains attach to. And so that's where I place my hope. And I, and it's active hope because I spend most of my days trying to make it happen as best I can. Well, I can't resist following up then. So how much, <laughs> how much of that is your, your, because I asked this sincerely about your own Christian faith. I mean, is mm -hmm. that, is that, does that make that, hope uh, and i ask that sincerely i was raised catholic no i think in this case that doesn't make that's you more hopeful that there's a 
another part of this for you that that is? The only thing I'll say there is I think people of faith have an advantage yeah. in this respect in that they're allowed to hope or believe that if they do everything they can, there might be some other force in the universe that'll meet them halfway. But that's the exact opposite of the thing I sometimes hear people say, which is God will take care of these problems. There's not a lick of theology in the world to back up that idea. And it's absurd. Um, our job is to do everything we can to take, and, and it's by no means confined to Christians. We find exactly the same impulse all over the world and among people of no faith at all. Uh, 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 the impulse to do what you can for those around you. And that's the, you know, that's the thing that in the end makes us human, if anything makes us human. And so I, I put my trust in that, but I do hope that it operates quickly because climate is the first truly time limited problem we've come up against. That's why it seems urgent to me that we go to work and I'm back to work. Many, many thanks for an interesting interlude. Good. Well, thanks. My guest has been Bill McKibben. You can find him on the uh, Twitter at Bill McKibben. Uh, he also asked me to direct you to thirdact.org. So, Bill, thanks for coming on the Power Hungry podcast. It was fun. It was indeed. Take good care, brother. And all of you in podcast land, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Power Hungry podcast. Until next time, see you.